There's no one quite like Allen Iverson. One of the most dynamic, dichotomous basketball players of the last 50 years. The six foot tall David who slew seven foot Goliaths. Someone who routinely exerted more effort and will than anyone around him, but who couldn't be bothered with practice. An unabashed revolutionary who never set out with a cause in mind. His story begins in Virginia, where he was one of the great two-sport athletes in high school history. In his junior year in 1993, he was the Associated Press Player of the Year in football, playing quarterback, running back, defensive back, and return specialist. And he was the Associated Press Player of the Year in basketball, breaking Moses Malone's single-season Virginia scoring record and was named a first-team All-American. He led Bethel High School to state championships in both sports in the same year and was recruited by virtually every school in the country for both sports. Allen Iverson was on top of the world. Until he wasn't. If you are familiar with Allen Iverson and his story, you know at least some of what happened. It's as much a part of his story as the step over. I can't go into the details and dynamics nearly as much as I want to. And I really, really want to. So if what I do cover doesn't satisfy you and you want to know more about the trial, I highly recommend the 30 for 30, no crossover, the trial of Allen Iverson. On Saturday, February 14th, Valentine's Day, 1993, Allen Iverson and a group of friends were socializing at Circle Lane's bowling alley. Around 10.30 that night, a verbal altercation between the black group of teenagers and a white group of patrons escalated into a brawl. Police intervened and broke up the fight, placing four people under arrest. Allen Iverson and three other black high schoolers. As the story pertains to Iverson, he was allowed to complete the basketball season, capturing the honors we talked about previously. He was then tried as an adult of the felony charge of maiming by mob rather than for misdemeanor assault. He was refused bond and convicted, sentenced to 15 years of prison with 10 years suspended. He spent four months in prison before being pardoned by Governor Douglas Wilder. In 1995, the Virginia Court of Appeals overturned the conviction, citing a lack of evidence. That is the extremely simple Wikipedia page rundown of the sequence of events. But there are a lot of things that need to be talked about. For one, the origin of the fight remains unclear. According to the prosecution, Iverson prompted the fight with no provocation. According to Iverson, a white man recognized him, calling him a slur and a little boy. Iverson confronted the man and his friends before a white man threw a chair, beginning the melee. All of which is hearsay. In fact, there isn't much detail or evidence about anything pertaining to that fight beyond hearsay. Iverson was alleged to have struck a woman over the head with a chair, though he and others claim that he removed himself from the fighting altogether. One of the craziest things, though, is the crime he was charged with, maiming by mob, a crime that was designed to combat lynchings in Jim Crow era Virginia. The idea of it was to make it a crime to be a part of a violent mob. It didn't matter if someone else did the damage, hurt, or killed someone. If you were present, you were culpable. Even if you think that Allen Iverson started the fight, and even if you think he did hit someone over the head with a chair, a 15-year felony conviction with a minimum of five years in prison for a fight that resulted in no serious lasting injuries, where no drugs, knives, or guns were involved is an absurdly harsh sentence. He was tried as an adult and denied bail as a 17-year-old with no criminal history. No white people were arrested, and he was convicted under a statute designed to protect black people in Virginia. A statute that just so happens to require no proof of his actual involvement. Just by being there, he was guilty. I don't know what else to say. The entire ordeal reeks of blatant racism at worst, an irresponsible, mindless injustice at best. Again, I can't go as far into it as I want to. So please, please watch the 30 for 30. There's so much to be said. For those four months, Allen Iverson sat in the farm, crying as he read what other people thought of him. For the first time in his life, people whom he'd never met had opinions on his character. 
and that bothered him. In prison, Iverson describes developing rhino skin, an exterior too tough to pierce, forever ready to protect the parts of him that made him. Jaded, he came to terms with the fact that people were going to think things of him for the rest of his life, and that they were either going to make him a hero or a villain, despite the fact that he didn't truly want any part of being either. He'd changed in jail, his mother said. He'd seen the world right in front of his eyes, and he knew what people could do to you. After his release, Allen spent his senior year at Richard Milburn High School, a place for at-risk students, where he didn't compete in any form of athletics. In the spring of 1994, John Thompson, the head coach of Georgetown University's basketball program, visited Iverson and offered him a scholarship. Ann Iverson and her son had a deep connection. She loved her boy and refused to allow him to lose his chance at a better life. The same month of his release, December of 1993, after the scholarship offers had dried up and no one was willing to give him a shot, she had driven to Washington, D.C. and pleaded with John Thompson personally to give her son a chance. She was the reason why I helped her child, said Thompson. Iverson became a Georgetown Hoya that fall, debuting for the team in an exhibition game. Thomas Boswell of the Washington Post said, I saw Lou Alcindor, Austin Carr, Moses Malone, Alonzo Mourning, Albert King, Ralph Sampson, and Patrick Ewing play in high school. Now I have two memories on my impression top shelf. The man who became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Allen Iverson. In his freshman year, Allen Iverson won the Big East Freshman of the Year, the Big East Defensive Player of the Year, broke the school record for steals in a season, and helped the Hoyas reach the Sweet 16 for the first time in seven years. Despite what he'd been through, he had remained an otherworldly talent. He was still the undersized, shot-making, hit-taking blur that captivated audiences the second their eyes fell on him. But his first year at Georgetown wasn't without hardship. Ever mindful of his players and their well-beings, Thompson pulled the team off the court and threatened to boycott a nationally televised game against Villanova. A group of Nova students had dressed up in striped jumpsuits, holding a sign that read, Allen Iverson, the next MJ. But they'd crossed out MJ and written OJ. Unless those students were removed immediately, Thompson told officials. Georgetown would not play. As Iverson remembers in a Players' Tribune article written in 2018, Coach knew, and he could see my heart just sinking in that moment. He knew he couldn't protect me from everything that was in this world, but he sure tried. As a sophomore, Iverson led the Hoyas to a share of the Big East Championship, an Elite Eight appearance, and a final ranking as the number four team in the country. He again captured the Conference Defensive Player of the Year and was named a first-team All-American. After the season, citing a need to make money to support his family and a four-year-old sister who had begun suffering seizures, Iverson defied convention and became the first Georgetown player since John Thompson had taken over the program 24 years earlier to leave school early and declare for the NBA draft. He left Georgetown with the single season records for points and steals and was the school's all-time leader in scoring average. Records that all still stand. In the 1996 NBA Draft, the Philadelphia 76ers selected Allen Iverson with the first overall pick, the shortest player ever taken number one. And they did it for good reason. Despite being listed at six feet tall, the universal consensus is that Allen Iverson couldn't have been taller than 5'10", maybe 5'11". He was the NBA's league leader in minutes per game seven times over his 14-year career, and was legitimately resentful any time he was taken off the court. Over and over again, Iverson's opponents seemed prepared to let him tire himself out. The idea that a person could sustain his kind of production and exertion over the full course of a game series, or season an absurdity. And yet, time and time again, the responsibility of guarding Allen Iverson depleted his opponent 
before Iverson ever broke stride. He could very well be the quickest player ever, splitting double and triple teams with a lightning fast first step as he relentlessly threw himself into the fray, earning every layup and foul through blood and sweat. 160 pounds of muscle, hunger, and scar tissue, and not one ounce of quit. He was a dazzling player to watch, able to change direction and attack angles before a defense has time to react. He was described as relentlessly inventive, always seeming to make up his mind on what to do in the moment, doing things that had never been done, as if he were unaware of the limits of human anatomy. His body control, balance, and decision-making were inhuman, making him one of the very best finishers around the hoop that the game has ever seen. His streaky jump shot seemed to come alive in the big moments, and while he was no Gary Payton, his active hands and uncanny anticipation made him a defensive threat far beyond the reasonable expectations of someone his size. His attitude and confidence was unmatched, on par with greats like Robertson and Bryant, giving Iverson an edge over nearly every contemporary, fan, foe, or official alike. And of course, he had the crossover, the most lethal weapon in his arsenal. His signature, ankle-breaking, defense-shaking dribble that humbled an untold number of souls, including even the great Michael Jordan. Combine all of his physical attributes, all of his mental faculties, his unrivaled fortitude, and the filthiest handle outside of Kyrie Irving to ever be put on the floor, and you get the man they called the answer the eighth highest career scoring average ever, and the second all-time leader in playoff points per game. Allen exploded onto the NBA scene as a rookie, capturing the world's attention and winning the Rookie of the Year award amidst a loaded class. Although the Sixers finished with just 22 wins and 60 losses, Iverson had already begun etching himself into Philly lore. He set an NBA rookie record by scoring 40 points in five consecutive games. He torched the Cavaliers in April with 50 points, the first 50-piece by a rookie since Lou Alcindor 27 years prior. And yes, he scored 37 points in a March matchup with the Bulls that featured this immortal highlight. Take a look at the crossover. Mike said, no. Oh. Allen said, yes, the bucket, the crowd. Over the next few years, Iverson and the Sixers slowly improved as they began adding pieces around their exhilarating point guard. Players like Eric Snow, Aaron McKee, and Theo Ratliff, while head coach Larry Brown, hired in Iverson's second season, began to try to temper his superstar. Over the first 10 years of his career with the Philadelphia 76ers, Allen Iverson was a workhorse, leading the league in minutes per game five times clocking in with numbers that have few equals, if any, in the post-merger era. He became the shortest player to ever lead the league in scoring, set the playoff record for steals in a game with 10, and helped the 76ers become a mainstay in the playoffs, rejuvenating one of the sport's most storied franchises and fan bases. In those 10 years, he was an eight-time All-Star, a seven-time All-NBA selection, including three first-team All-League honors, was twice named the All-Star Game MVP, led the league in steals three consecutive years, was the NBA's top scorer four times, and was named the NBA's most valuable player for the 2000-2001 season. He was a highlight machine for all the reasons we've already talked about. A full-time resident in the SportsCenter Top 10, all backed up by gutty, intense, soulful performances night in and night out. As for individual seasons, I have to try my best to keep it brief. We'll save 01 for the end, but Iverson played the 2000 season at full tilt, furiously fighting to bring the Sixers back to the playoffs after he missed 12 games early in the year, breaking his thumb after diving for a loose ball. He did just that, spurring the Sixers into the postseason, and was the only player other than Shaquille O'Neal that earned an MVP vote. 2005 was another of Iverson's very best campaigns. He devolved into a more capable distributor, registering the best passing numbers of his career, 
to go along with a league leading 30.7 points per night. His relentless intensity and crunch time heroics carried a putrid Philly team to the playoffs, earned Iverson a handful of MVP votes, and another selection as a first team all NBA talent. Throughout his tenure as a Philadelphia 76er, Allen Iverson resonated. He was a special kind of athlete. Like Steph Curry years later, kids saw Allen Iverson and saw someone they could relate to. What he lacked in size, he made up for in heart. He cared and fought for every inch in every basket. He carried himself like a boxer, someone who knew that they were gonna get hit, but who was willing to die before giving up. It was a mindset and an attitude that married him to the city of Philadelphia forever. They loved Iverson, and he loved them right back. Philly was the first place and the first time since his ordeal in Virginia where he'd gotten respect and love from people who didn't know him. The more they cheered, the harder he played. And the harder he played, the more they cheered. And of course, maybe Allen Iverson's greatest impact on basketball was his style, in every sense of the word. Beyond just his play style as a shoot-first scoring guard, with every trick in his bag and a rejection of the traditional duties of his position, a style that has virtually defined the past eight years of NBA basketball, he wore what he wanted to wear. He talked about what he wanted to talk about. He looked how he wanted to look and said, fuck anybody with something to say about it. He wore baggy everything. He sagged his pants. He wore flashy jewelry. All of that in the early 2000s, plus his iconic cornrows and tattoos, added fuel on the racially stoked fire that suggested he was a danger, a thug from the projects with a shady past. It didn't stop Iverson, who bristled at the idea of changing himself to be more popular or to be accessible. He loved hip hop because that was the music he grew up on. He identified with it. He dressed how he wanted to dress because that was his childhood dream. He didn't dream of buying suits. He used to say that growing up, suits were just what you wore to church. He wanted new shoes, a fresh haircut, and authentic jewelry because those were the status symbols of where he grew up. An impossible notion for many white Americans to get their heads around. Nonetheless, Iverson was a trendsetter. Just look at the league. Nearly every player now has tattoos. The cultures of basketball and hip hop are irrevocably linked. And headbands and arm sleeves are commonplace more as fashion statements than as practical accessories. Players revel in their abilities to express themselves through their style and fashion, unafraid to be themselves. Not all the credit can be given to Iverson, but damn if he doesn't deserve a lion's share. Of course, there was criticism of Iverson that can't be attributed purely to thinly veiled racism or ignorance. He was the unwilling face of the me generation. His detractors criticized him for dominating the ball and taking bad shots. Some said that his intensity and efforts were often misguided, that his firm belief in his own abilities hindered the development of his teammates and the success of the team. He clashed with coaches throughout his career, with the exception of John Thompson, earning him a reputation as a coach killer. He had a famous, if not slightly overblown, disdain for organized practice, resulting in his iconic practice rant. Not, not, not the game that I go out there and, and die for, and play every game like it's my last. Not the game. We're talking about practice, man. I mean, how... He was also an illustrious partier, often found in nightclubs and casinos in the wee hours of the morning. He was a magnet for controversy throughout his career, including an instance in which, so the story goes, David Stern himself stepped in and stopped Iverson from releasing his own rap album after a single was leaked that contained homophobic language. Iverson missed charity and team events on multiple occasions, all of which gave many the impression that he just didn't take any of this very seriously, that he was irresponsible. Nearly all of those criticisms have at least a little substance. He made plenty of mistakes that altered his reputation and perception. And the first person who would tell you that is Allen Iverson. Of all the things that Allen Iverson did or does, from his play, to his style, to his mindset, 
It all seems to stem from his incredibly authentic humanity. Not to excuse, but to better understand Allen Iverson, it is important to know where he came from, even before Bethel High School. Allen was raised by a single mother who gave birth to him at the age of 15. He and his siblings grew up in a house built above the city sewer line, often with no heat or electricity. He learned not to wear shoes inside, because sometimes the sewer line would leak and there would be an inch or two of raw human waste on the floors. Sure, he dreamt of wearing new clothes, but he also dreamt of saving his family from generations of poverty and struggle. Which is exactly what he did when he went to the NBA out of Georgetown. By the age of 23, when he signed a max extension with the Sixers, Allen Iverson had saved his family. He was taking care of all of them. His mother, his girlfriend, their two kids, two siblings, an aunt, three cousins, two uncles, and his father figure. All living in the same Philadelphia suburb, thanks to him. I hate to speak for him, but I get the impression that he wasn't necessarily focused on winning the finals every year and being the GOAT. He was trying to take care of the people who loved him. And once that was done, he could focus more on playing for the sake of his basketball legacy. In the middle of the night, on his way home from the club, he would often call his mom for the third or fourth time that day, waking her up just to say I love you and to thank her for having him. He said to his family the night before he was drafted, wherever I go, everyone goes. Whenever I eat, everyone eats. In sports, the traits that make you successful are not necessarily the traits that make you a good human. You don't really want to have a lot of sympathy in the middle of a UFC fight. You don't want to be gentle when you're a middle linebacker. So sometimes you forget that athletes are human. Jordan crying in the locker room reminds us that he hurts too. Tyson caring about his opponent reveals that he can be compassionate. But nobody ever overlooked or forgot the humanity of Allen Iverson. The end of Iverson's career came somewhat ignobly. It's not the kind of story that saves its best for last. At the end of the 06 season, Iverson's fastball was slowing down. He was traded to the Denver Nuggets and spent time with the Detroit Pistons, Memphis Grizzlies, went back to the Sixers, and even played three games in Turkey over the next five years, with success varying from quality contributor to outright disaster. He officially retired from basketball in October of 2013 and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2016. You can look up those last few years if you want to. I don't really feel like talking about them. Instead, I'd like to point out that Allen Iverson remains one of the most popular and respected figures in and around basketball. Unlike greats of previous generations, Iverson is eager to dole out praise for the league's current stars. Players still talk about him for what he is, one of the most influential players in the game's history. In his 2018 Players' Tribune piece, Iverson talks about how he's finally at a place in his life, separated by enough time from the game and the spotlight, where he gets to just be a person, the thing he'd been trying to do all along. And, like everyone, he's still figuring it out, trying to improve and get better. Hopefully he'll get to keep doing that, and we'll never see Allen Iverson peak as a person. But he did peak as a basketball player in the 55th season of the National Basketball Association, the 2000-2001 NBA season. Over the three prior seasons, Iverson and head coach Larry Brown had begun butting heads so much that Brown was ready to have Allen shipped out. A potential trade was put together after the 2000 season that would have seen Iverson shipped to Detroit. But Matt Geiger, the Philly big man included in the trade, refused to forfeit the $5 million trade kicker that he was owed. The trade fell through and Iverson remained a sixer. As the story goes, Iverson was so shocked by the trade rumors that he relented. If he and Brown were stuck together, he might as well try Brown's approach. Almost immediately, the media caught wind that something was changing. Allen Iverson was coming to practice. Early. He was doing the drills and hitting the weight room, adding pounds and strength to his slight frame. 
He even went so far as to approach Brown and ask to be made co-captain of the team with his backcourt partner Eric Snow, to which Brown obliged. By the time the season rolled around, the Sixers were galvanized behind their coach and their star's newfound approach to the game. Through the first 10 games of the season, the Sixers were 10-0. It was working. By the All-Star break, they were 36-14. and Allen was an All-Star starter in one of the great All-Star games of the last 30 years. He rallied the East, scoring 15 points in the fourth quarter to help engineer a 21-point comeback, culminating in a one-point Eastern Conference win and the game's All-Star MVP honors. At the trade deadline, February 23rd, already in possession of the league's best record, the Sixers traded for another Georgetown prospect to pair with Iverson. One of a different breed, the seven foot two Dikembe Mutombo. In the midst of putting together perhaps the best season of his career at age 34, the center was at his most dangerous on the defensive end, swatting away shots and delighting Philadelphia with his trademark finger wag. The Sixers finished the season with the best record in the Eastern Conference. The end of season award list was chock full of Sixers. Brown won Coach of the Year, Aaron McKee, the team's spark plug and defensive specialist off the bench, won Sixth Man of the Year. Matumbo won a fourth Defensive Player of the Year award and was selected to both First Team All-Defense and Second Team All-NBA. While Iverson, who had shouldered the load all season and committed himself like never before, became the shortest and lightest player in NBA history to be named MVP. Allen Iverson, the guy who couldn't make teammates better and couldn't be the best player on a winner, was the NBA's most valuable player. And while the regular season remained special for the Sixers and for Iverson, the true magic came in the playoffs. In the first round, Philadelphia trounced the Indiana Pacers, the team that had bounced Philly out of the playoffs the last two years and one that Brown had helped coach to relevance. Iverson averaged 31.5 points a game and played 184 minutes and 8 seconds of a possible 192 throughout the series. In the second round against Vince Carter's Raptors, the series went the distance. To say that Iverson had his moments is an understatement of the highest order. He scored 54 points in Game 2 and 52 points in Game 5, both Sixer wins. And in Game 7, he registered a career-high 16 assists to help lift the 76ers to a one-point victory. In total, he rested for less than 12 minutes across the series' 336 minutes of game time. For the first time since 1985, the Sixers had reached the Eastern Conference Finals, where they faced another grueling test in Ray Allen's Milwaukee Bucks. The individual matchup between Iverson and Allen took top billing and neither disappointed. The two stars and teams brought out the best in each other, pushing the series to another Game 7. Although Iverson had missed Game 3 trying to recover from a hip injury he'd sustained in Game 7 against the Raptors, the Sixers were up 3-2 going into Game 6. They lost that Game 6 on the road, despite Iverson's exhilarating 26 fourth quarter points. Although they hadn't won, the 76ers had felt the momentum start to shift their way again. Game 7 was a blowout. Iverson finished with 44 points, and the 76ers won by 17 points, punching their ticket to the finals for the first time since 1983, where they met a juggernaut, the 2001 Los Angeles Lakers, led by the immortal duo of Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal. The feud between Kobe and Shaq had tanked the Lakers' regular season, but with a little help from the Zen Master and Derek Fisher, the Lakers had bounced back and become a buzzsaw in the playoffs. They'd swept their way all the way to the finals, 11 wins and zero losses against the Trailblazers, the Kings, and the Spurs. The Lakers' dynamic duo were in the midst of playing their most impressive basketball together, forming the best one-two punch in league history. 
Nobody gave the Sixers a chance. According to SportsOddsHistory.com, the 01 Lakers remain the most favored team in a finals matchup since at least 1974. The outcome was a certainty. The Lakers would win and they would probably sweep, becoming the first team to complete a perfect, undefeated postseason. And of all the teams to ever make the finals, the 01 Sixers relied on Iverson as much as any team has had to rely on a single player outside of LeBron James. Iverson's offensive workload was historic. The shots he had to take, the minutes he had to play, the beatings he had to endure were essential to their success. He had to be a supernova for the Sixers to stand a chance. The peak of Allen Iverson, the basketball player, occurred on June 1st, 2001, game one of the NBA Finals. The Lakers dominated the first quarter of play, ripping off 16 straight points on their way to a 21-9 lead in front of the Laker faithful. And then, Allen Iverson left his body. Everything that he was on the biggest stage erupted into being as he went nuclear, ending the first half with 30 points. Carrying that momentum, Philadelphia blitzed the Lakers in the third quarter, opening up a 15-point lead. But basketball is a game of runs, and the Lakers had their answer, thanks in large to two men. Shaquille O'Neal, the Diesel, started pouring it on and overwhelmed Matumbo, bringing the Lakers back into the fight. And Teron Liu, the Lakers' diminutive guard, did the impossible. He put the clamps on Allen Iverson. With the Lakers surging, Iverson scored only three points in the fourth quarter, with Lou contesting every shot and harassing him around every screen. With the Laker comeback complete and the game tied at 94, Eric Snow missed a desperate game-winning attempt at the buzzer. Game one of the finals was going to overtime. The Lakers scored five straight points in the period to take the lead. Phillies' Raja Bell answered. And then the answer woke up. Seven consecutive points to give Philadelphia the lead, punctuated by his last two. A move and a shot that would become the iconic image of Allen Iverson. The step over. Philadelphia won that game. 107 to 101. Iverson accounted for seven of the Sixers' 13 points in the overtime period and finished the game with 48 points. Iverson's 2001 postseason didn't culminate in a title. The Lakers would go on to claim the championship and their argument as the best team ever, winning the next four games of the series in a row. All the same, Iverson's 2001 playoff run remains one of the stunning singular efforts by a basketball player. The minutes are out of this world. A regulation NBA game lasts 48 minutes of game time. In the 2001 playoffs, Iverson averaged 46.2 minutes per game, over 22 games played. That's the highest minute per game average of any player who has played 19 or more games in a playoff run. It's the seventh most minutes ever played by a player in a single postseason, period. No player in NBA history has played as many minutes in as many games. And his responsibilities didn't end by just being on the floor and inspiring the team. He had to be the 76ers' first second, and third options offensively, which he was. The only players to average more points in as many games in NBA playoff history are Jordan, LeBron, and Hakeem, none of whom put near as many minutes on their odometer. And remember, Allen Iverson is 5'10 and 160 pounds, a Herculean burden shouldered all season long, delivering Philadelphia to their first NBA Finals trip in almost 20 years, and a triumph of a performance to steal a game from the Los Angeles Lakers. For one night, he made people believe. 
For one night, the Philadelphia 76ers were winning the finals against the Los Angeles Lakers, denying them a perfection that had seemed inevitable. For one night, the world of basketball knelt to Allen Iverson. He was not supposed to make it. He had talent, but people from where he's from that have gone through the things he had gone through were not supposed to make it to Georgetown, to the NBA, to hold the most valuable player trophy, to carry a team to the NBA Finals, and to deliver a masterpiece that knocked a dynasty at their peak to the canvas. Allen Iverson didn't really change the way basketball teams are constructed. Perhaps you still can't win playing the style he did. But the undeniable fact and the enduring mark of his legacy is that he did change basketball.